In Living Memory, Jolyon Jenkins looks back to the 1970s and the Portsmouth Symphonia, the self-described world's worst orchestra. <laughs> That's Life, September 1979. Esther Ranson presents more consumer complaints, hilarious misprints and talking dogs. <laughs> this week, Esther has a complaint from Mike Robinson, who lives near Canterbury. I am a serious music lover, so when I came across a selection of my favourite classical pieces in the record shop in Herne Bay, I bought it at once. He took it home and played it. The William Tell Overture. It sounded like this. <laughs> That's all we can stand. <clears throat> And that unique performance you'll be happy to hear was by the Portsmouth Symphonia Orchestra. The Portsmouth Symphonia. That's Life discovered the Symphonia rather late in the day. By 1979, they'd already played the Albert Hall. They'd had acres of news coverage and boasted among their members musicians such as Brian Eno and Michael Nyman. Although they were marketed jokerly as the world's worst orchestra, they also took themselves very seriously. James Lampard played saxophone. I asked him, what was the point of it all? The point? Uh, the excitement and trying to interpret music in a, in a different way, really. You saw yourself as part of an avant-garde movement? Yeah, when we were on a bill, we were as part of London's new music scene. We thought the music was really good. The Symphonia was started by Gavin Bryars, a professional musician and composer who, at the start of the 1970s, was teaching at Portsmouth College of Art. It was a time when a lot of art colleges employed people under the umbrella of what's called either complementary studies or liberal studies, people who were not fine art practitioners but did other things which could, in a way, inform those other arts. The orchestra was formed by really from the group of students who I worked with. And one day we had the idea of forming a, a real classical orchestra. We first had to find out who would want to play in it, and these were generally the people who I worked with on these different music projects. But of course, most didn't really play uh, instruments even tolerably well. Various people who wanted to be in it had to acquire instruments. Most people didn't actually have them. I, for some reason, decided to play the euphonium because I found one in a bicycle shop. The leader was art student Robin Mortimer. I bought a violin for five pounds in a junk shop and I was away. And people turned up the next day, amazingly, about, I should think, 20 people with various musical instruments, euphoniums, double basses, drums, violins. And certainly Gavin's input at that point was that we've got to play the William Tell Overture. He says if we're going to play the popular classics, we've got to play music that people recognise and love. It went down so well that we did it as an encore. We didn't think anything would carry on. It was just a one-off and that was the end of it. But I think Gavin wanted to record what we'd done and it just created an interest that people thought, oh, let's just try and keep playing and maybe learn some new numbers. And uh, I think the next thing, we got offered a spot on Beethoven today at the uh, Purcell Rooms in London, some of our people we were working with were organising that and uh, we were asked to do Beethoven's Fifth so uh, that was another piece that we, we started working on and I think we were going to do the whole lot but we were advised in the rehearsal in the afternoon it might be a good idea to just get the bits that people recognised <laughs> It was Gavin Bryce's connections in the world of experimental music that got them the surprisingly prestigious Purcell Room gig. 
It was the Beethoven bicentenary, and there's been all sorts of performances and celebrations and so on, and all sorts of reinterpretations, deconstructions, and all kinds of things related to Beethoven were put on. And the Portsmouth Symphony was asked to play there, really through me, because I was involved with a lot of the planning of that concert, and I did other things in it. Briars was friends with Michael Nyman, who went on to achieve huge success as a film composer, but at that time was a music critic and writing a book about the experimental music scene. I was persuaded, I don't know how I found out whether this was direct invitation from Gavin to attend a Portsmouth Symphonia concert at Sir John Cass College, as was, opposite Whitechapel Art Gallery. I turned up and sat through the first half of the concert. I was just overwhelmed because at the end of the first half in the interval, I said, look, I want to play. Do you have a spare instrument? Yeah, there's a spare cello. So I kind of became a cellist for the day. Never played a cello before. I actually never played one after that. And then I progressed to an old euphonium that Gavin had that I think was so kind of rotten that I just... It didn't produce any notes, I just kind of sang through it. And then a bass trombone. British experimental music in the 60s and 70s had more in common with the world of conceptual arts than with the classical tradition. This was a time when, for example, one composition by George Brecht started with the instructions, build a fire in front of the audience. So it was understandable that the art students who started the orchestra appointed their conductor on aesthetic grounds alone, Gavin Bryars. John Farley, the conductor, was chosen really because he looked most like a conductor. He studied all the photos of Carrion in profile. He had long black flowing hair and looked terrific. I mean, he was um, completely incompetent as a musician. He's not really giving a beat, is he? I don't think John would know a beat if he saw one. And what's he doing? He's just there for decoration. Yeah, he's seen lots of photos. He's, in a sense, he's rather like a kind of mime artist. Membership criteria were very democratic, says James Lampard. If someone wanted to come and play, they could do. The only thing was it just had to be taken seriously. If someone was messing about them, they'd be told that, that that's not what we wanted. Would you have been excluded if you were a good musician? I think you'd be encouraged to try another instrument. Why? I think we needed people to be trying something they, weren't, they were a bit uncomfortable with, that they weren't too cosy with. What would have pleased us more than anything would have been to do something which a real music lover would love and accept. Well, you could have done that by playing the instruments you were competent in. For example, you could have played the double bass instead of the euphonium. I'd have been the only player in the orchestra playing an instrument he was familiar with. Nobody else was familiar with any instruments at the outset. But wasn't there a rule that even if you were proficient in an instrument, you had to play another one? No. No, that's a, that's a that's kind a of... Myth, it's it? a rather scurrilous rumour put about by the BBC, I think. There were, from time to time, for example, there were people who did join the orchestra who were professionals on their instruments. I remember at one point there was a a trumpeter called Ted, who was a professional trumpeter, and he played with us when we played at the Roundhouse in 1972. And we thought he was going to show us up and it would be really very embarrassing. But of course, Ted, like a good musician, was someone who was concerned to follow the score and to follow the conductor. In both cases, there were huge gaps in the uh, conveying of information. So Ted was ready to come in with an entry, he looked at John, John would probably be looking somewhere else and point to the wrong person and Ted would just fluff his note like everybody else. Even if the no-competency rule existed, there were occasional exceptions. Michael Nyman. We were rather more respectful to the pop classics than we appeared to be with the classical classics because we did things like Bridge Over Troubled Water and they insisted that the introduction was played by a real pianist. So I was allowed as a real pianist to play the intro to Bridge Over Troubled Water. But I think that's the, that's the only time when a performer with expertise on a particular instrument was actually allowed to play the instrument that they were expert in. As the orchestra expanded beyond its art school origins, it recruited other genuine musicians. I remember trading performance information with Brian Eno. I mean, he was either playing a violin or sitting next to me because I was playing a violin that day. You know, I was asking him about, you know, how one plays a major second, and he said, well, it's about kind of two inches or something. And we were doing it by measurement rather than by sound. 
Eno ended up producing the Symphonia's first two records, and it was the fact that the Symphonia got a record deal which distinguished them from other bad orchestras. Their publicist was a young record company executive called Martin Lewis. He was the one who invented the world's worst orchestra tag. We thought, gosh, this is a bit of a hoot. We've got nothing to lose here. Why don't we sign them? The first album was recorded in the summer of 1973, a studio album called The Portsmouth Symphonia Plays the Popular Classics. The record company's original idea was to release it in the late autumn of 73, but I encouraged the record company to wait until we could have a big London concert. I felt there needed to be a big send-off. And what we did was we did a concert initially at the Mermaid Theatre in March of 1973 and this was a 500-seater theatre, but it was incredibly successful, the concert. The place was packed and the media went crazy. And that gave us the idea of going further, which was to put on a concert at the Royal Albert Hall. And the orchestra numbers swelled for that occasion. They'd been running at about maybe 30, 35. But for the Royal Albert Hall in May 74, we had an orchestra of 82 and a choir for the first time of 300. 150 people who couldn't sing. As well as recruiting singers for their Albert Hall concerts, the orchestra also enlisted a proper pianist, Sally Binding, now Sally Fletcher, who at the time was a student at the Royal Academy of Music. I was looking for an orchestra to play a concerto with. I phoned them up and they told me that they weren't exactly the sort of thing I was probably looking for, but they took my name anyway. And then a few weeks later I had this phone call inviting me to play Tchaikovsky's piano concerto with them. So the Tchaikovsky piano concerto is in B-flat minor? Yes. Which is how many flats? Five. So quite difficult for some amateurs. Well, no, I had to, what I had to do was transpose it because they played it in a, in a different key. To what? To A minor. Which has got no flats? Yeah. I mean, they kept with me the whole way through. You didn't I... have to stop and start again? No, no, the actual performance went really well. And you were doing your best as well, presumably. Oh, yeah, I practised like mad. I had some lessons on it with my old piano professor who was called Paul Hamburger, who was Austrian and thought it was so funny. To be doing it in the wrong key? Yeah, well, yeah, the whole thing he thought was wonderful. The Albert Hall concert got huge publicity, but, as usual, members of the Portsmouth Symphonia were slippery when journalists tried to pin them down on what it was all about, for example, on Radio 4's Kaleidoscope. Many questions spring to mind, none more urgent perhaps than, are we having our legs pulled? Is the Portsmouth Symphonia a very good Hoffman-type musical joke, or does it have a serious purpose? Robin Mortimer, leader of the orchestra. Well, it gives people an opportunity who haven't had a formal musical training, a chance of playing this beautiful music, and in public. Uh, with the added bonus of making en- entertainment as well. Gavin Bryce, you, I gather, were once Robin Mortimer's teacher. You were a lecturer in music, and I would have thought that as such, you might have felt that people ought to learn to play instruments in, in the quietness of their own padded bedrooms rather than inflict their inabilities on, a, on an audience, isn't it, sir? Well, I never did it that way. When I was a music student, I taught myself to play the double bass, and within six months of starting to play the double bass, I was a professional bassist. Most bass players tend to play wrong notes permanently. So that I had, uh, there's a sort of history of playing badly in public anyway. Are you playing badly deliberately, or are you trying to play better than you play? I'm doing the best I can whenever I play. It's not a send-up. We're not sending up the pieces anyway. It's not like the Hoffman things you mentioned, with the possibility of being a musical joke. Uh, it's not that. Those, I think, were deliberately created for people who were in the know, sort of in jokes for professionals. Uh, This certainly isn't intended in that way at all. Are you intending to be funny? We're well aware that it's funny, and and that must be the entertainment part of it. Even today, Robin Mortimer denies that it was meant to be funny. The humour was purely accidental, because sometimes pieces weren't funny at all. For example, when we played a a slow tempo piece like 
we did Bach's Suite in D major, you know, the air on a G string. No one ever laughed at that because it was just a slow approximation of a piece of Bach. Right, that's interesting. Why is a fast piece played badly funnier than a slow piece played badly? Uh, I suppose that is because you get a, a clash of cymbal out of time or you get someone carrying on after a rest. Those tended to be the sort of humorous things. I, I think also maybe what made people laugh was their expectation. There was a, just a magical moment at the Albert Hall in the piano concerto when even to a vaguely trained ear, it just sounded absolutely right. I mean, one, because we had a concert pianist playing the piano concerto, and people were amused by that, that suddenly for two bars or maybe one and a half bars, it sort of sounded great, and then it, then it became the Portsmouth Symphonia again. Clive Langer, who played the flute in the Symphonia and went on to become a highly successful record producer and pop performer, agrees that the humour came from people's thwarted expectations. The funny thing was... I mean, it's a bit sad for some of the people, but um, there were a lot of people came to the Albert Hall expecting a proficient orchestra. So there were people kind of walking out all the time. People were shocked and surprised. I mean, there was no other orchestra who did anything like that. I mean, you had bad orchestras, but no one was as, as bad as the Portsmouth Symphonia. And so people were misled, and they'd <laughs> turn up at the concerts and be very shocked and um, more often than not leave. So was that part of the point to upset and annoy and surprise people? I, I don't think so, no. But um, it was a bit misleading. But that was, in a cruel way, quite funny. There was a musical anarchy. It was quite threatening. We upset people in the kind of music profession, which, which delighted me entirely, because how could they get upset? They got so angry at what we were doing. So do you remember Fritz Spiegel, who was a critic and a musicologist and did a lot of he was absolutely livid at what we were doing. He thought it was outrageous that we should be at the Albert Hall or we should be playing at an art school or we should be even be doing it. He just was so incensed. And I, I loved that. I just thought it was great because I just apologised and said, well, sorry, but this is, this is what we do. The orchestra even annoyed representatives of dead composers, as in the case of Richard Strauss. <laughs> We put this on the record and the Strauss estate complained. And their complaint, of course, was that we had rearranged the music. And we explained to them very patiently that, no, we were playing the actual notes, it's just we weren't very good. And therefore there was nothing they could do about it and case resting. So, if the Portsmouth Symphonia was more than just an art school prank with good PR, what was the serious point? It's not easy to get to the bottom of this. Michael Nyman included a section on the Symphonia in his book Experimental Music and Beyond. The wonderful thing about the Symphonia is this whole kind of tennis thing of unforced errors. I mean, that's what basically it's all about. So there's this kind of curious sense of intention and accident, which is the thing that interests me me a lot and um, there's a kind of individual accident of actually not being able to play well enough or even you know pitch the right notes and the the combination of all those accidents and misapplied intentions that combine together to make this kind of wonderful sound that is you know forever the symphonia clive langer the sound that was made was quite interesting at times it created a new kind of sound even though it was quite uh, in most people's books, a bad sound. I quite liked it. I was listening to quite a lot of, obviously, you know, being brought up with kind of abstract jazz and some atonal music. There were moments when everything worked and it sounded as it should, and that was quite an achievement. And then there were moments where it was so kind of lost that it was, and chaotic, it was interesting to listen to the chaos. Gavin Bryars, the composer who founded the Symphonia, places it within the tradition being established by the American composer John Cage. Well, at that time, a distinction was drawn between avant-garde and experimental. It really comes to prominence in Michael Nyman's book, Experimental Music. And he drew a distinction between the rather high-minded 
European avant-garde, which one could see its line coming through Schoenberg, Webern, Boulez, Stockhausen, into the whole European avant-garde centred in Germany, France and Italy. And the more loose experimental form of music, which comes about really through Cage and his successors, which is less, if you like, intellectually rigorous in, on some ways, but artistically sometimes more adventurous and is prepared to go out more on a limb. European avant-garde music was often highly notated and complex. British and American experimental music was often barely notated at all, and it played with ideas of indeterminacy and chance. The Portsmouth Symphonia was a little bit like that. To me, it's no different from a sort of cage piece where individual players prepare their parts according to a kind of scheme. So you produce your part, and the next musician produces his or her part you combine all these things in the same sort of space and time, the overlays throw up a lot of accidents. So these are not unforced errors, but I see the process as being totally parallel, totally analogous. Not that American experimental composers always saw the connection. There was a, a killer meeting between representatives of English experimental music scene and Steve Reich, and Steve came with his tapes and kind of pontificated about minimalism and played these kind of pristine, very determined and deterministic music. At some point we said to him, we would like to play you some of our music, and we, we played him the recording of the William Tell Overture. The sheer look of incomprehension on his face was something never to be forgotten. He wasn't a fan of unforced errors? I uh, certainly not, no, because all his music was to do with the opposite of unforced errors. and when, Precision. With precision and, and correctitude. But did the Portsmouth Symphonia's music have any artistic merit? Gavin Bryars thinks so. I think it was some of the highest quality stuff around. Orchestra leader Robin Mortimer. From a musicological point of view, what people found in, interesting was if you get a trained orchestra and they tune up, you get a perfect A note in the strings and it sounds wonderful you've got the symphonia string section to try and play a single note and you've got this wonderful sort of dissonant harmonics and of people trying to get the eventually they might all get together but and that was i think the sort of interesting thing musically on the other hand it does sound rather like a bad school orchestra and they're to a penny and don't get recording deals pianist sally fletcher is a dissenting voice do you think it had any artistic merit <laughs> Um, can I say no? <laughs> what about the idea that in these discords there's a kind of a strange beauty? Well, there's a strange beauty in, um, I don't know, anything. A pile of mud, isn't there? I felt it was time for a come-off-it question to Michael Nyman. Well, surely incompetence is everywhere, every town has an amateur orchestra that plays pretty much like the Portsmouth Symphonia. Yeah, but, but, but you're not doing a documentary about amateur orchestra. So I'm wondering why there's something special about well, the Portsmouth no, because, Symphonia. Because, but What's I'm, the but difference? I'm, but, I'm, but I'm, well, apart from the fact that it existed in a particular way at a particular time with particular kinds of musicians with the, the rule that you didn't play your own instrument. So just as the fact that your toddler's paintings look like Jackson Pollock doesn't make your toddler Jackson Pollock, the Portsmouth Symphonia's reputation seems to hinge on the fact that it was art students and experimental musicians playing badly. The orchestra carried on performing and recording to the end of the 1970s, and then it just faded away as members pursued other interests. So does it have a legacy? Clive Langer of the group Deaf School. It's just pre-punk, wasn't it? So there's a bit of a punk ethic about it. Do you think it actually influenced punk? It could have done because it was an art college thing and, you know, probably people like Malcolm McLaren and Bernie Rhodes were probably aware of the Portsmouth Symphonia, if not there. Did it have any influence on you artistically later on? Yeah, it, it had a lot of influence on Deaf School, but even our name. I mean, we started this band at Liverpool Art College and we recruited people who were um, interesting looking rather than being great musicians. Again, a kind of pre-punk ethic like I said, we called the band Deaf School. We, well, we did rehearse in, in an old school for the deaf, but it kind of coincided with the idea that maybe we were a bit tone deaf, we weren't great musicians, but we wanted to, to start a very interesting musical band.
Michael Nyman went on to become famous with his compositions for films like The Draftsman's Contract and The Piano. Although he eventually settled into a style more like Steve Reich's, his early work was, he says, influenced by the Symphonia experience. What's interesting about the early Michael Nyman band, the Campiello band, where I, I invented a kind of Venetian town band one of the kind of results of the instruments I chose to use, I chose to use medieval Renaissance instruments, folk instruments. There were unforced errors in the sense that a lot of these instruments were incredibly out of tune, not only with each other, but with themselves. And this was, you know, just conditioning from, or not conditioning from the ports of Symphonia, just the acceptance that that is a valid and rather thrilling way of, of making The rough edges. Yeah. Right. Although the Symphonia didn't perform after 1979, they did release one last record in 1981. You might remember in the late 70s and early 80s there was a plethora of medley records, different artists were putting together all their songs with a, a disco hand clap. And the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra got in on the act and recorded this series of lollipops called Hooked on Classics. I was horrified, as were the other members of the Symphonia. We felt that we had gained the title of the world's worst orchestra. And along with came the Royal Philharmonic, clearly worse than us. We had to retaliate, and our retaliation was to come up with Classical Mudley. Classical Mudley moves from tune to tune with barely a pretense of editing, and at one stage even moves into a disco handclap waltz for the Blue Danube. We did get voted by Radio Clyde in Glasgow as the worst single of all time, and they're not a radio station easily given to superlatives. We'd hit the summit, we'd been up Mount Everest, and where do you go after us? So I think at that time we realised that we should take a hiatus, and so far the Portsmouth Symphony has been on hiatus for about 33 years, which is good because, you know, if we have a comeback, we'll get in the Guinness Book of Records for that. Do you think there's any chance of reforming? Oh, absolutely. No, I'm determined to do it. Well, we shall see. Gavin Bryars. Time is going on. You know, I'm 68 now. People drift away. I think Martin Lewis is thinking about maybe trying to put together one last thing, and that would be very interesting if he did. Yeah, he's been talking about it since 2004, so... He talked very slowly. We had a reunion in a pub in St John's Wood about a year ago, but not many people sort of turned up there. In Living Memory was produced and presented in Bristol by Jolly and Jenkins.